Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at St. Paul Lutheran. Whether you're a member of this congregation or if you are a visitor, uh, wonderful things are happening in this place. We're blessed to be a part of this uh, this morning. A few in our congregation are going to receive the Lord's Supper for the first time today, a gift from God that nourishes and sustains all of us. Uh, And there is tremendous reason to give thanks for this gift, uh, and we say amen to God's promise in faith. Uh, A couple of birth announcements, uh, a couple of week-and-a-half-year-olds are new members of this congregation, so we celebrate this wonderful thing. Hunter Lee Roseboom, son of Nicole and Austin, uh, was born on August 9th, uh, brother to Madeline and Bailey, grandson to Jarris and Leanne Rensink, and great-grandson to Wayne and Dottie Tiedemann. Uh, So we celebrate uh, the birth of Hunter on August 9th. One day later, uh, Bo Dale Schroeder was born to Brooke and Colin, little brother to Renly, grandson of Dale and Diane Fick, uh, Fink, uh, Fick, sorry. And uh, so this is another reason to celebrate. You are all uh, providing daily bread to one another on a daily basis, especially parents to those kids. And those kids are giving back to you in the ways that they do. So this is a wonderful thing that we celebrate. Uh, The junior Lutherans, uh, junior high and high school age, will go to Lake Pahoya for some fun this afternoon. We'll meet here in the parking lot at 2.20 and then uh, get on our way shortly after. Bring a sack supper if you can. The nominating committee welcomes your thoughts and interest in serving on committees for terms beginning in 2023. I wanted to make mention of that. Uh, You can check your bulletin for additional announcements. Erica Tiedemann has an announcement on behalf of LifeWise. Good morning. Um, The LifeWise committee wanted to give you guys an update on where we're at, and we have a couple of prayer requests as well. Uh, We are starting this fall for fourth through sixth graders. It will be on Friday mornings at the in the basement of the Presbyterian Church across the street and Tina Korselman is going to be the teacher. Um, The prayer requests we have on tomorrow we have an open house where we are inviting the parents to come in meet the teacher learn more about the program. Um, We're praying that it goes smoothly and that more people come and do sign up and that we can answer all questions that they have well so they can understand the program better. Um, We are still looking for a director to lead the program. Currently the board is juggling all of the director roles but if you are interested or if you know someone who might be interested please come talk to me after church. And then lastly the goal of LifeWise Academy is that children can attend without the parents having to pay an extra fee. So we have started fundraising, and um, we know that without supporters, we can't pay for the program. So if you are interested in donating, or if you could just pray that we do get the funds to cover the cost of the program, um, that would be super helpful. And if you have any questions, come find me after church, and I can try and answer them. Thank you, Erica. And as you hold Callie Ray in your arms, who was born in June, we're also looking forward to her baptism next Sunday. So this will be a wonderful thing, a wonderful uh, blessing from God and promise from God on that day that is crucial. So we'll do that next Sunday. Thank you. All right, we'll begin worship with the call to worship. Please rise if you're able. We gather under the sign of the cross and then in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Loving Shepherd, you know our names. You care for us. When we hunger for your love, fill us with your presence. Come, 
walk in green pastures. We follow the shepherd. Come, dine at the table of abundance. We are fed by the shepherd. Amen. Our opening hymn is Prayed to the Praise to the Lord the Almighty, 543 in the Green Hymnal. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Mighty God, your Son, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. Sanctify us by your Holy Spirit, that our lives may be pleasing to you, and we may enter through the narrow door. Grant us the joy of your salvation, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, come on up for the children's chat. Good morning. Hey, Cyrus. All right. Do you guys know? Hey, is it a good morning or what? All right. So, do you guys know what these things are? You see them? Have you seen something like this before? And do you know where you've seen them before? Yeah, communion. We call it the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. What is this? Yeah, it's a wafer. It's an unleavened piece of bread, kind of. And what is this? It's a cup. And with that, there's a little wine or a little juice in there. So during the Lord's Supper, we do this. Now, some of you have done some prep work. I know three of you have learned more deeply about what this is. So how, kids, when do you know... You're ready to take this Lord's Supper. When is that going to be for you? When you're bigger and older, yeah. So if you look out in the congregation, a lot of the people that are not up here right now are, are older, aren't they? And they've taken communion before. They receive the Lord's Supper every first and third Sunday here. So what is it about them that makes them ready to receive it. They're dressed pretty nicely. Is it, they're pretty good at giving gifts. Is that what it is that makes them ready for the Lord's Supper? It's be, is it because they dress up so nice or maybe they fasted or like didn't eat for a long time to get ready for it? Is that what it is? So what is it that makes a person ready to have it for the first time or to have it again and again? Guess what? It's not uh, how they're dressed. Were you going to say something, Madison? Yeah. So they come to the realization of something, that they're a sinner, and they can't save themselves. They recognize that there's a weight of sin upon them. And what they receive in the Lord's Supper is Jesus Christ, his body and blood, that forgives in the forgiveness of that sin. Now, this is a wonderful promise that all of you have. Now, some of you are closer to the day you were baptized than others. You guys are probably closer to that day than many of the people out there. So when you get old enough to recognize, I'm a sinner in need of being saved, that's generally when we say, yes, this Lord's Supper is for you. And what does it deliver? The forgiveness of sins. So 
this is a wonderful promise that we get from God and it goes into our bellies and we know it for us when we receive it. So some of you might walk around with a promise. You don't, might not need it quite yet. But someday you might. And God will be there to give you that, that promise that delivers you new, brand new, when you take it. All right, let's pray. Let's do an echo prayer. Lord God, you give me a promise, and you are trustworthy. You forgive my sins, and we love you for this. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to where you came from. Hopefully the bowl is, has enough items in there. And we'll continue with our readings from this morning. So our first reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, beginning at verse 18, and you can follow along in your pew Bibles on page 1166 if you'd like. The verses leading into um, where we're going to start at chapter 18 give us a picture of the judgment that when Christ is coming in his second coming. So if you want to read back on that sometime, Um, It's worthwhile, but we're going to begin at verse 18 this morning. And I, because of their actions and their imaginations, am about to come and gather all nations and tongues, and they will come and see my glory. I will set a sign among you, and I will send some of those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans, the Lydians, famous as archers, to Tubal and Greece, and to the distant islands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory among the nations, and they will bring all your brothers from all nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord on horses, in chariots, on wagons, and on mules and camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonial clean vessels. And I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. And the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord. So will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. And they will go out and look upon the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. Their worm will not die, and and nor their fire will be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. Our responsive psalm is Psalm 50, verses 1 through 15, and you can follow along if you'd like on page 888. The Mighty One, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the spring of the sun to the place where he sets. Our God comes and will not be silent, a fire devour before him, and around him a tempest rages. Gather to me, my consecrated ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God.
I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens. I know every bird in the mountains and all the creatures of the field are mine. Do I eat the flesh of the bulls or drink the blood of goats? And call upon me in the days of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor me. Our second reading comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 12 beginning at verse 4 and you can follow along if you'd like on page 1,877. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as dis discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you are not disciplined, and everyone does undergo discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all the human fathers, have had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while while we, th as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights to his oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. We could bring no charge of my, we could bring no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm to a trumpet blast or such voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further words be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. This sight is so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you who have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, you come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits and righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of our new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better words than the blood of Abel. Here ends our reading. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. <laughs> then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door 
because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. seated. You can imagine being in this man's position because you have been him before. You've asked the same question, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Perhaps he's asking for someone else, someone in his life that he's close to. Maybe he's wondering for the, the guy right next to him. It's possible he's wondering if his son or daughter will be saved, or his grandkids, or maybe it is this. He's wondering, am I going to be saved? How will I know? On what basis will I be judged? Am I going to get in? This is something that we all experience, and Jesus has some mind-rattling things to say. Grace to you. Yes, you, right here and now, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who presents the question has been listening to Jesus say things like this. It is more difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. That you should sell everything you have and give it all to the poor. That merely being angry with your brother is equal to killing him. The more he listens to these things, the more concerned he's getting. There are no loopholes in the commandments of God. Even obedience by the letter of the law does not change the sinful heart of this man behind even his best works and deeds. So he's thinking, considering these standards, who's going to be saved? Is there some system that Jesus would give me? A riddle to solve, maybe. A process by which I could gain some control over this saving thing? And also, it must be about my obedience to the law, right? Jesus' response goes directly back at the questioner and all those who are listening. Strive, work, make every effort. Contend against your enemies. Go ahead, sin, death, and the devil. Figure out how you will get through a narrow door. Go ahead, knock yourself out. And what will the striving get this man? What will our striving accomplish? Will God reward you for trying your best? Will the Lord see you make every effort and then decide that he likes what you're bringing forth? Sometimes we think this way. I'll try my best and then God will do the rest. I'll go to church like a lot and merit that will merit favor. Maybe I'll treat my boss very kindly, even when I really don't feel like it. Or go to su serve at the food shelf. Make my life slightly less comfortable, because let's be real, I can't get rid of everything that gives me comfort. 
I know people are starving, but I can't pack food for the hungry every day. I need a day to put my feet up. Do you see what has happened? We tell ourselves that we will try our very best, but we only really do the bare minimum. If that, I've been a middle school teacher before. Nobody is trying to set world records. You don't do your best. And even when you do, you're forsaking one thing to do another. One ball goes up and another hits the floor. And I haven't even approached the subject of the heart behind these acts. Is the striving that you're working at for the good of your neighbor, or is it actually for you? If you do something nice for someone, knowing that it's at least partly for your own gain in this game, is that what you want to bring before God on the throne? Will that be enough? So we look at where this striving has gotten us, and it's deeper and deeper into ourselves and our inner quest for righteousness, and away from the one who came to save us, and away from our neighbor in need. And based on this evidence, we come to the conclusion, if God knew me, he wouldn't choose me. He wouldn't invite me to his house despite making every effort for obedience, the question remains, what side of the door am I on? Jesus says to your attempts, you will stand on the outside knocking and pleading, but the owner will say, I don't know you. I don't know where you come from. You'll plead and beg, we saw you. We ate and drank with you. We heard you teach, but this will be met with our Lord talking to us like we're a stranger. Away from me. You've been thrown out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, this is getting worse, not better. We were hoping for a lot more control in these matters of being saved. You were hoping for a system to follow. For St. Peter to be the one standing at the pearly gates with a tidy little riddle for you, that you could solve. Who is in charge of this gate, this election? Is it St. Peter? Do I have a say or any control in this matter? This is not a riddle. Jesus is at the door. Jesus Christ is the bouncer who lets some in and tosses others out. And he is the door itself. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is clear. There is no way in, no way to be saved apart from Jesus. He's making that call. Some get in, and some do not. Many of us hold out hope that, oh man, Our merciful God wouldn't do that. Well, there is overwhelming evidence in Scripture that God would do that. Universalism doesn't jive with the living word in Scripture that kills and makes alive when it is preached. It is a denial of God's word and the election that is his to go the other way. Maybe you did know that God is in charge, but you were looking for different evidence that would render you innocent. Yeah, God chose me because he knew beforehand that I would be so obedient to his will. He likes that about me, so I'll be in. We tried to set up a system again, but in the end, the measurement for any system is the law. It's based on your obedience, your works, or maybe you could acknowledge that it is the grace of God that gives you these law superpowers. In your mind, God ends up with two lists, and both of them are based on obedience. The one list is the naughty one. The other list, the good one, 
is comprised of people that God destined beforehand to do really great stuff that only the all-star Christians could do. Now this system theoretically does have God as a sovereign righteous judge determining some to go to heaven and some to hell. But it is on the basis of the law. And where does that leave our confidence, our certainty? It's shaky. Let's say I volunteered at the food shelf on Friday. Well, I must be on the good list. I didn't yesterday. I wonder if that means I'm on the naughty list. Do you think I could list jump? You see, when obedience is the thing that gets you through a narrow door, there isn't a whole lot of peace and comfort to grasp hold of. So, Jesus is not playing by the rules. We don't get an explanation for why some are known and chosen and that some aren't. This is clearly not a system that is based on neat and tidy laws. The law is not the standard by which the bouncer Jesus uses to let in or push out. It continues to be terrifying, this word, especially if you want control over this salvation thing. Can you get through the narrow door? You just need a little crack, right? Well, we studied for the test, but we had the wrong textbook. Jesus is clear on this. There is no riddle. There is no system by which God ceases being almighty to allow you to do your thing. He's not even choosing who gets in and who is out based on obedience to the law at all. Your ability, or is it inability, to love your neighbor and your God perfectly or any other form of the law at all that you'd like to use has no say in the matter. What side of the door are you on? Under your control and your striving, you're on the wrong one. With a made-up system that Jesus doesn't provide you, you might have false hope on some days, but never be quite certain. You're put right back in the game, looking for the rules that might indicate that you're winning or losing, that tell you that you're in or you're out. Regarding your salvation, the system and riddle theologians would say, you never know for sure. To those on the outside, the owner gives a haunting word, I don't know you. Only those who are known by Jesus Christ, the narrow door, will be given entry by the gatekeeper. It is not obedience, it is being known. You're probably wondering now, does Jesus know me? Will he let me in? A theologian of the cross says what Jesus says. He calls a thing what it is, and it is certain, not wishy-washy. And I will not withhold this news from you any longer. Jesus has attached himself to you. In this very moment, Jesus has these words for you. I forgive you, and I give you myself for your forgiveness of your sins. You are being elected with these words, and he is giving you entry. He's making the call. You're in. It is not because you earned it. It was not your obedience to the law, shockingly, but he chose you. The Lord of all creation chose you to baptize puts a mark on you that cannot be erased, for our Lord does not lie. You can look for it on your body, but you won't find it. You can look for obedience as a sign, but it's going to be blurry. But in your baptism, you have been marked by the cross of Christ forever. Jesus' name is on your head. Your name has been united with the name of your Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Your name was spoken that day. 
I baptize you. And this is the word of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Although you do not see this mark, when God looks at you, he sees his son. And you're getting into the party that's being thrown for the air, Jesus Christ. It is giving me great joy to announce this. It is not my promise, but a promise from God that is trustworthy. God wants you to hear it. You can forget what list you're on. He knows you, and you are his. Amen. We'll now sing our hymn of the day, hymn number 245 in the LBW Green Hymnal, All People That On Earth Do Dwell, five verses. Today is a special day for several of our young members who have now completed their preparation for partaking in the Lord's Supper. I'll ask Dylan Anderson, Madison Anderson, and Colin Wellendorf to come forward with their parents, if they could at this time. When Dylan, uh, Madison, and Colin were baptized, God made them a part of his household, the family we call the church, through the forgiveness of sins. As they grew, and they learned about their Heavenly Father and the promise that God made that day. They learned what Christ did for them on the cross, the depths that Jesus went in order to take our sins and die by them. They've learned that Christ is risen, and that he delivers his chosen people the forgiveness of sins that had put him to death. In the same way, they have learned what the Lord's Supper do does for those who carry the burden of sin in this world. The Lord's Supper is a gift that Christ's betrayers receive. 
The Lord's Supper delivers exactly what the words say they will. Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, and with it a promise of life and salvation. Faith believes in this promise. The Lord's Supper is not a sacrifice. It is not a play. It is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given with bread and wine, instituted by Christ himself for us to eat and drink. I'm going to give you your uh, catechism packets that you've completed with one another. Dylan, Madison, and Colin have expressed a desire to receive this gift of the Lord's Supper, and they will receive it for the first time today. I'd let, ask the rest of the congregation to stand at this time as we welcome them uh, to the Lord's table. As the pastor of St. Paul Lutheran and a fellow member of this church, I say this together with the congregation present. We welcome you to the Lord's table. We thank God for you and are happy that you are among us. I'll ask the parents or sponsors to lay hands on the first communicants as we pray for them. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for Dylan, Madison, and Colin and the promise you gave them in their baptism. Hold them fast to it. Help them to remain faithful to you, Christ, and your holy church, finding joy and strength in your body and blood through the forgiveness of sins. Amen. All right, you guys may go back to your seats, and you can share peace with one another as they do so. All right, let's join together in confessing the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious God, help us to remember the promise you gave us in our baptism, in which the water, together with God's word, delivered us once and for all from death and the devil, giving us faith that your everlasting salvation is for us. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, we thank you for those who come this morning for their first communion. Bless them as they come forward to the table of your blessed Son. Nourish us with this supper that is yours, and help us to receive the gift of your Son in faith. Sustain us with Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Trinity, we confess that in unbelief, we don't want to leave room for you you to do your will. We ask that you break this down in us, and that your will be done and that your kingdom would come to us. Lord, in your mercy, ever-present God, may all who are ill in body, mind, or spirit find comfort, hope, and healing in Christ's abiding presence. Through our actions of care and concern, may they experience the reality of your loving kindness. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty God, Let the fruits of the earth be received for our benefit and for your praise. Bless the people in our community, state, country, and world with your presence and your word of hope. Free us with your word and use us in the ways that you will. Lord, in your mercy. 
Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and poured it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All who are baptized have been instructed properly and trust God's word are welcome to the Lord's Supper, where our Lord is truly present, offering his gifts of forgiveness and eternal life. The gifts of God for the people of God. All is ready. You may be seated.